So before I start, I'd just like to say thank you to the organizers of the conference for inviting us to talk about cane toads here today. We're, we're very excited about this system and to share with you our plans for a project that we're just beginning. So my name is Leanne, I'm at Deakin University in Australia and I'm a molecular ecologist. And my co-author is Rick Shine, and he's here today with us. And he's an ecologist whose group has done about 10 years of ecology of in invasive populations in Australia. So I wanted to start with talking about what makes a great model species for genetic studies of rapid evolution. And I'll talk about this in, in the context of what we know about cane toads. So I think one really important feature is that you want a species that has a short generation time and high fecundity. And cane toads certainly fulfill this because they breed annually and they um, lay up to 30,000 eggs per clutch. You also want exposure to powerful evolutionary forces. And both of these things basically increase your opportunity for, for seeing um, evolution over our time scales. And once again, um, Australian cane toads fulfill this as well because in their native range in Central and South America, they live in a really wet environment but in Australia, they live in a wet, dry tropic. So across that range for part of the year, it, it, it's quite dry and they have a very different environment that they're exposed to. You want a species that's readily available so you can go and pick them up and do lots of manipulative experiments. And, and cane toads are certainly fulfilling this. And they're all over the place in their invasive range in Australia. And even in areas where they hadn't been a year before, if you go there, you can find um, a lot of toads on, on the range front. You would like to have a species that has a really well understood ecology so that when you find interesting genetic features, you can make some sense of what they actually mean. And we have um, a great body of ecology, especially with respect to dispersal in Australian cane toad populations. And I'll talk to you a little bit about this today. Um, but cane toads um, disperse after the, when they become metamorphs after the first rain, they start to move and they move for the rest of their lives. And we've um, radio tracked cane toads in Australia that have moved up to 22 kilometers in one month, which is pretty impressive for an animal that's that big. And um, we also know that cane toads in Australia are, um, are toxic at all life stages to um, Australian native animals. So especially as, as, as um, eggs, they're the most toxic. And this obviously has um, some really strong implications for um, the persistence of those native animals in Australia. So you also would like to have a study system that has some evidence of phenotypic change so that you have some confidence that when you go looking for genetic changes that you'll find them. And I'll talk quite a bit about this today. And finally, it would be best if you picked a system that had great genomic resources like a published genome. And unfortunately, this is the one um, area where cane toads fall down. There is someone currently working on a cane toad genome, but they're having um, considerable difficulties trying to assemble it because it has high levels of repetitive DNA in it. So the plans that I'll talk to you about today are plans that are not built on having that kind of resource. So my talk today is in two parts. The first part I'm gonna talk a little bit, um, only a tiny bit really, about the, what we know about the um, evidence of phenotypic change in Australia. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the genetic plans that we've made for this project. So cane toads were brought to Australia from Hawaii, which is also um, an introduced population, in the 1930s. And they were um, bred and, and spread across about 1,200 kilometers of um, Queensland coastland, the coastline. And they, by 2008, had spread across the top end of Australia and into Western Australia, where you see that line. Um, and since then, they've moved right into that area that's highlighted in red, which is the Kimberley. So they're right into that region now. And we also know that they get around with humans as well as by themselves. So if you have a look at that picture, that's a sniffer dog um, that is being used over in Western Australia to find toads that are stowaways on vehicles. And we know that, for example, in Sydney, that about 50 toads a year get a, get a ride with someone down, to, down the east coast of the country. So we're definitely helping them get around. So I'm gonna talk about a group of experiments today and they fall into two broad categories. So if you have a look at the four black dots that are on this map, they represent a transect that Ben Phillips um, collected in 2006. And Ben is here with us um, this week as well. 
Um, and he collected these animals and took them back to our research station, which is where the red dot is, and bred them and used the F1 generation for a number of experiments. The second group of experiments were time series um, experiments that were done at the field station. So cane toads moved through that area in 2004, and they um, have been measuring various characteristics of animals that have come through there annually since. So that's quite a nice dat data set. So there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about phenotypes that increase invasiveness. And some of the more obvious things are those to do with dispersal ability. So these might be longer legs or um, greater endurance or a straighter, moving in a straighter path, for example. And we do know that modeling suggests that in, um, that in range expansions that there should be selection on dispersal ability. But what about dispersal propensity? Just because an animal can go somewhere doesn't necessarily mean that it will. And this is an area that has gotten quite a bit of focus in recent years, and um, David Chappell, who's here with us, has written a really nice review about the role of personality um, in, in invasion. But perhaps one of the more well-known examples is the work done by Renee Duckworth's group on western bluebirds and how more aggressive individuals are the ones that are expanding the range in this species. So what about immune function? Well, that lovely picture up there is a picture of a cane toad lung, and those are um, invasive, um, they are, excuse me, native parasites that came with the introduced toads to Australia. And Ben Phillips has shown that in the first one to three years that toads move through an area on the invasion front, they don't have these parasites. And this is in line with some predictions that were made by Lee and Clazing about what we might expect would happen on the invasion front where, um, where animals are um, experiencing enemy release and they might be able to shunt some of their energies towards other, um, other functions rather than costly immune function. And that was shown quite nicely in um, house sparrows. So a couple of years ago, Rick and his group published a paper about spatial sorting, which I expect many of you have read. Um, and in this paper, they talked about how um, you could have differential successive genes through space instead of through time. And they called this the Olympic village effect. So effectively, the toads that hopped the farthest only had each other to breed with, and that went on and on, selecting for that ability to move. And the thing that distinguished this from natural selection is that you didn't actually need a, an increase in lifetime reproductive success. So some of the evidence that um, exists to suggest that those toads that are on the range expansion front might not be as fit as the ones from the core are that they have increased incidence of spinal arthritis and they have higher rates of mortality. So this work suggested that any sort of trait that enhanced dispersal should be selected for. So once again, that would include straightforward things like locomotion, but it could also um, include personality traits or even things like being able to downregulate immune function so that you can um, disperse better. So perhaps the paper that's most well, um, best well known from all of this work is Ben Phillips' paper in 2006 on dispersal. And he showed that longer leg toads move further and that over time, leg length decreased. So this was standing at that research station that I showed you in measuring leg length. And the effect of this is that you would expect that the actual range expansion should accelerate. And in fact, that's what was shown in this paper. Um, you can see on the East Coast in blue where was, is the expansion rate where the toads were first introduced. And as you go across um, in a westward, westward direction across the country, that invasion front accelerates, and in 2008, when this was published, it was estimated to be more than 50 kilometers per year. We've also, um, Ross Alford's group has, has looked at um, two invasion fronts, so the two dots um, to the north on this map are two separate invasion fronts, one from 1991 and one from 2004, and compared those populations to one that is near the introduction site on the Queensland coast. And he showed, um, so if you have a look at the, the top graph here, sh shows the older established population. The middle graph is the um, first invasion front, and the more recent one is on the bottom. And he showed that those range-edged edge toads have a higher probability of moving. They move in a straighter path. They move longer distances each time they move. And then the effect of this is that their overall displacement is greater. 
So we also have evidence that range-edge toads have greater endurance. So this was a study that Llewellyn did looking at two groups. So one group on the left are the invasion front toads, and on the right you see the um, established population. The top graph shows you speed, so there's no difference in speed. But on the bottom graph, you can see that total distance moved for these two groups was significantly different. And once again, the effect of that is that the top graph shows you the invasive population, so they're moving, um, they're displacing greater amounts than the, the core population. So what about personality? What do we know about that in toads? Well, we don't know a lot about it right now, but it is an uh, active area of research in our group at the moment. But there was a paper published um, earlier this year. So these guys went out with um, cages that had lights attached to them. And so lights obviously attract bugs, and bugs attract toads. So some of the cages had conspecifics, and some didn't. And they collected these toads. And those that came to two cages with conspecifics, they called shy. And the other toads, they called bold. And then they did an assay, a time to emergence assay. And they found that those animals actually were um, responding differently. And so this suggests that there is some variation in these sorts of traits in the population. Um, cognition is another area that's being looked at at the moment. So we do know that brain size has been correlated to invasion success in birds and mammals. And more recently, that's been shown in amphibians and reptiles. And we have people at, the mo at, at this point in time that are out doing experiments both in, in laboratories and in the field in great setups like that one you see in Western Australia. Um, and there will be quite a bit of work, hopefully, coming out of this um, area of our research. So when we look at immune function in this population, we do see some differences in metabolic response to bacterial endotoxins. So if you have a look at this graph, across the bottom is distance from the introduction point, um, with the um, ed range edge populations being to your right and the controls are on the dashed line at the bottom. And so you can see that um, metabolic um, response is no different from controls on the range edge, but it is different at the core. And this is in line with those predictions of glazing, lean glazing. This year, Greg Brown did um, published a paper where he looked at he radio tracked toads, and he looked at how far they moved over a number of days and then looked at bacterial killing assays, and there was um, a relationship between, um, so the, the further they moved, the less um, of a response that they had. So when you see this, you might predict that those individuals from the common garden experiment that I mentioned before that were on the range front, that they might actually have a lower response um, in this assay. But in fact, when you look at it, it's actually quite the opposite. So those guys on the invasion front had the highest response here. Now, this has been explained as, as potentially some sort of compensatory mechanism so that those individuals that are on the front are the ones that have to move the most, and perhaps it's, um, it's beneficial for them to upregulate their immune system because of that. Um, but I would say that this, this experiment was a bit different than the, the movement experiment because in the movement experiment, those animals were out and very active. And in this bottom experiment, they were at the field station and being held. So um, that, that could have some impact on these results. So anytime we want to look at genetic change, we need to make sure that we're not looking at, at phenotypic plasticity. And we do know that um, there are some good examples of that in, in Australian cane toads. Um, and in order to tease this apart, it's really important that we do multi-generational common garden experiments and then we do manipulation so that we can figure out really what's happening. And I haven't talked at all about epigenetics, and that's because we don't know anything about it, but we're planning now to do um, a series of experiments to try to get into this. So now I just want to talk a little bit about what our plans are. So we know that in um, introductions that often rapid evolution occurs, and that happens sometimes even when there's very low genetic diversity. And this has led me to ask the question, does environmentally induced epigenetic change drive uh, rapid evolution? So in order to answer this, I think what we need is we need some measure of epigenetic marks. And in our case, that's probably going to mean methylation, since we don't have a reference genome. You need then to look at gene expression to see that those epigenetic marks are actually doing something. And you need to look at sequence data so you can separate out genetic from epigenetic effects. 
So the experiment that we're just starting has two um, broad um, sections. The first section is to look at variation in the wild, and we're hoping to identify some candidate genes that seem to be important to invasion in the species. Um, and to do this, we're going to do another tram sampling transect across um, what is now the entire range with some replicates on both ends. So we'll have nine sites about 200 kilometers apart. And we're going to do transcriptomes of muscle, brain, and spleen and look at gene expression and SNPs in these data. And we're hoping to find um, some loci that have patterns that look like the two graphs that you see on the left in the middle. So we might expect to see some gradual increase or decrease in gene expression, or we might see a stepped change, which might have some relationship to local environment, or we might see something completely random, which is what the third graph looks like. So those, those are the, the um, genes that we won't look at anymore, and we'll, we'll have a look at the, the first two as our candidates. We're also going to do genotyping by sequencing with methylation-sensitive restriction enzymes. And we'll look for non-neutral loci. And we'll also use presence-absence data to detect differential methylation. And any locus that we suspect that's occurring, we can validate using SMART MSP. The second part of this project is go going to be a, a large common garden experiment. And this is going to have a, a, a methylation diet manipulation. So it has been shown in some taxa that, that feeding mothers can alter epigenetic status of offspring. It's not been done in amphibians, to my knowledge, um, but we're going to give this a go. And we've already collected individuals from the core and the edge and started this experiment, and the F1 individuals are coming through now. So the idea is that we'll treat those F1 individuals with, with either a methyl plus or a methyl minus diet or a control, and then the, the subsequent generation, the F2s, will, will assay. And we'll look at those phenotypic traits that I've talked about already. So we'll look at dispersal trait related traits um, and immune function and personality. After those are done, we'll collect the tissues from these animals and once again look at gene expression, methylation analysis. And we can do um, look a specific PCR um, from, for our candidate genes to look for evidence of genetic or epi epigenetic change. So we've actually started this, and we have done a muscle transcriptome. We've been able to functionally annotate over 26,000 of our contigs. So if you just have a quick look at this, it's a bit complicated, so I'll just walk you through it. So this is, these are genes that are significantly differentially expressed. And the, the more red the gene is, the higher the, the gene is expressed. So in columns, you see individuals, and in rows are genes. And the map at the top shows you where these individuals came from. So we had five individuals from each of those four populations. And those colors are coded on the bottom. So you can see how they fell out with respect to population. So we had two main groups of individuals there. And in group one, almost all of those individuals were from the core. And in group two, they were all inv invasion front in individuals. So you can see there are large blocks of genes that seem to be doing something interesting. Um, I just want to preface this by saying this is all extremely preliminary. We've only just gotten these results, and I just wanted to show you that it's actually appearing to be a little bit interesting here. So these genes are generally um, genes to do with metabolism and cell adhesion. And if you just pull out, so this is a list of some of the genes that have the highest fold change. And the ones that have black arrows up are upregulated on the invasion front, and the, and the red arrow is downregulated on the invasion front. And if you just kind of run your eye down that list, these are all genes that you might expect would be involved in um, individuals that are physically stressed. So obviously, we'd like to include those transect populations that I talked about before we make any um, grand conclusions about this. But also, in these experiments, you always have this issue of cause and effect. So if you look at these genes, you would expect that, sure, maybe an animal that's doing all that movement, this might just be an effect of that movement. So having that common garden experiment is really important to try to tease this apart. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to say what role these genes might have in invasion. So in summary, I just want to say that I think there is really strong evidence of evolution in these, in these toads. And we think it's a great model to study for rapid evolution and also looking at genetic and epigenetic mechanisms of invasion. 
We're going to be increasing the genetic resources in the system over the next few years to hopefully make it easier for other people to work on it. And we're really pleased to be here today and we're keen to get feedback from you all and also people that have great ideas about toads, please come see us because we're always looking for great collaborators. And I'd just like to say thank you. That's our um, research team and the guy on the right is Mark Richardson and he is the bioinformatician that's been working with us. Thank you.